QuickBooks Online 2024. Reversing entry related to accounts receivable, sales, revenue, or income. Get ready, some coffee, and relax. Because we can do bookkeeping on the shoreline with QuickBooks Online 2024. At least if you can get an internet connection by the shoreline. But anyways, here we go. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one. Because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Here we are in our Geek Great Guitars 2024 QuickBooks Online sample company file. We set up in a prior presentation, opening the major financial statement reports as done every time the reports on the left. We're in the favorites, right-clicking on that balance sheet so we can open a link in a new tab. Right-clicking the profit and loss, also opening link in a new tab. The same thing done with the trustee trial balance, the good old TB. Tapping to the right, closing the hamburger, changing the range in from 010124. Let's go to 033124 this time because we're doing a reversing entry in, in the following month after the cutoff, selecting the drop-down to see this on a month by month breakout and run it. Tabbing to the right, same thing. Closing the ham boogie, changing the range, going from a 10124 tab, 033124 tab, changing the range, the months, and then refreshing the report, tabbing to the right one more time, closing the ham burger, and range changing it, going from 010124 tab, 033124 tab, and selecting the drop down for months, run it. Let's go back to the balance sheet. We've been working on the adjusting entries and now we're doing a reversing entry, which is intimately linked to the adjusting entries. Adjusting entries done at the end of the period, either month or year. Our cutoff date for the practice problem is February. So we're trying to make our books as correct as possible as of February, according to the basis that we're on, which is typically an accrual basis, but could be a tax basis if you're trying to do your books and get them ready and lined up for taxes. We're looking at an accounts receivable type of transaction this time, and this would be one that possibly you wouldn't have too much if you're a small business or something. You, you might not need this kind of adjusting entry, but it could be there for businesses in particular those that are uh, have a job cost kind of system. Let's give a recap with our trusty flowchart. This is a desktop flowchart we're using for online purposes just so we can look at the flow of the forms. If we have a type of business where we're invoicing a client, then one way that might happen is in a job cost kind of system where possibly we have staff doing work for us, say in a CPA firm or a law firm, and we're gonna have to collect their hours that they worked and bill out their hours, which probably is only gonna happen twice a month or possibly once a month. That means by the time we enter the invoice, then it might be after the cutoff date, even though we did the work before the cutoff date. So technically from an accrual standpoint, we should be recording revenue at the point in time the work was done, uh, which is usually closest to the actual data input form of the invoice. That's why QuickBooks uses an invoice. In other words, how can QuickBooks determine when the work was done? The only way QuickBooks can determine that is if you do some type of data input form into the system. The form that's gonna be closest to the date that the work is done is the invoice, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that is entered on the same date as the work was done, which it often will not be if you have this kind of job cost kind of system. So technically then what we should do is recognize the revenue before the cutoff date for those invoices that were entered after the cutoff date, but for which the work was done before the cutoff date. So that's gonna be the idea here. We entered the adjusting entry last time. 
And to see that, uh, we basically entered an invoice in March. So let's go to March here. We could see this invoice. We did it with inventory because that's going to complicate the journal entry more. Although it might be more common in a job cost system possibly where you don't have the income inventory like a law firm or something like that. So you can trim it back and make it easier not having to deal with possibly sales tax or inventory in that case. But here's the invoice. This is not the adjusting entry. This is the invoice that was entered after the cutoff date in March, which we are imagining needed to be pulled back to before the cutoff date. If we look at that invoice, here it is. It's the sale of uh, some a piece of inventory. So the easiest way to do this, you might think, well, why don't you just change the date here to something before the cutoff date? And the general response to that would be, well, we don't normally want to do that in the adjusting department because whatever the accounting cycle is doing, we want to keep online with the accounting cycle. We don't want to start messing up the normal flow of the accounting cycle. Instead, we want to add transactions to it to adjust and then reverse them if necessary so that we don't mess up the normal accounting cycle. So if that's if they bill or whatever every two weeks or something and that's what they do, I don't want to change the invoice so it looks funny when they're trying to look at their billing structure or something like that. So I'm going to say let's close this out and let's go back. And so that recorded that invoice recorded then an increase to accounts receivable. Uh, it recorded an increase as we can see to the revenue in March. It recorded then a uh, increase in the sales tax accounts, the sales tax payable accounts in March. And it recorded a decrease in inventory because we sold inventory and an increase in cost of goods sold. So we then had to enter that transaction before the cutoff date not with an invoice, but a journal entry. So then we entered a journal entry here as of the cutoff. So I wanted to bring that income into before the cutoff. And we can see in the uh, sales that we have sales receipt invoices and then this journal entry. So we can clearly see, oh yeah, there's a journal entry that was input here. That looks like an adjusting entry because it's as of the cutoff date, as of the end of the time period. And it is in a journal entry uh, type of format. So here's the actual uh, journal entry in terms of debits and credits. I would first basically try to type this one out in debit and credit format because we can't really get around debit and credits here because it's a longer journal entry and somewhat complex. So we made this first and then we entered the journal entry. So if I go into this one, we could see the journal form. There it is on the debits and credits. This is basically what it looks like in Excel format. So now we need to do a reversing entry to reverse it for the first day after the cutoff date. Why is that? Because if I don't do that, then all of these accounts, such as the revenue account, will have recorded revenue two times. So the whole point of this adjusting entry was to get it before the cutoff date. So if I close this back out, we could see we got it in there before, uh, before the cutoff date. But if I bring it, us up to the next month, then it will have been entered two times. So we want to get it before the cutoff and then reverse it so that it won't mess things up uh, at the second at the next month in that it would have been entered twice if that were the case. So how do we do that? Well, we can look at the journal entry. Let's go into that journal entry again and we can do the exact opposite of it. Now, if I go into here, this is this is my journal entry here and you can see that we constructed it basically in terms of debits on tops, credits on bottom. That's how you usually construct journal entries. Although we even deviated that from that format here by breaking the journal entry out into basically two components. So it used to be in textbooks, you would see this journal entry as accounts receivable debit and then cost of goods sold debit and then the sales, sales tax and inventory credited, possibly the inventory above because it's a larger dollar amount, the sales tax. However, that's kind of ugly to look at because it's a lot easier to understand the journal entry if you look at it this way. So I would c continue that concept of saying, hey, look, I'm not gonna construct my journal entries, debits on top and credits on the bottom just to make people happy because it because it's supposed to be some proper arbitrary rule. I'm gonna construct them in a way that I can understand them, read them, 
others can read them clearly. So if I come back to it later, I can I can more easily piece together what I did. Right. So I'm going to I'm going to minimize this. So how do you do that? You're just going to repeat the whole thing. I'm not going to try to put the debits on top and the credits on the bottom. I'm just going to repeat the whole journal entry and then reverse it. So here's the reversing entry. So this was a debit. Now it's going to be a credit, right? And then so a credit's on top, not a problem. Here's going to be the debit or the credit. Now it's a debit. That was a credit. Now it's a debit. On the cost of goods sold, we had a debit. Now it's a credit. And then the inventory was a uh, a credit. Now it's a debit. So note, that's the way you, I would suggest to construct, say, a reversing entry. It's kind of like doing a credit memo. If you've done a credit memo before, which kind of reverses the sales transaction. What I, what I wouldn't do is try to memorize the credit memo transaction because it's weird in your mind. Everything is backwards. What the easy thing to do is, is, is think in your mind or actually write out the normal transaction and then reverse it entirely, not trying to be fancy and reordering the accounts in your mind so that the debits are on top, but rather just keeping the same order from top to bottom and just adjusting or reversing the debits and credits. So this should look kind of funny to you, of course, because it's it's backwards, right? So accounts receivable is going down, not because we paid off, we got a payment on it, but because we're reversing the sales. The sales is going down. That looks funny because sales almost never goes down. It only goes up in the credit direction typically sales tax is going down which again is weird because normally it only goes down when you pay off the sales tax cost of goods sold is going down which is the opposite of what it normally does because it's an expense and expenses almost always just go up it's quite rare that an expense like cost of goods sold would go down and then we have the inventory uh, which is going up not because we're purchasing something but because we're reversing it so that's how I would think about it. And then we can go in here and say, let's just do it. I'm going to close. So you can also, you might want to screenshot this journal entry in practice or put it in a separate tab, right? I would pull this over in my other window and then open up another journal entry so I can just copy the same format of it and then uh, reverse it. Also note that they do have a reverse, uh, a reverse button down here, which I, I haven't used all that often, but that obviously might be an, an easy way to go. Let's actually try that. Let's duplicate this. And then I'm going to pull this over here and close this out and go back and say exit. So let's try their reverse button. Boom. And look at that. <laughs> Woo. So, so then it reversed it just perfectly. And I, and I, and it did it and it even changed the date for me on, on three, one. So yeah, that I like it. Mui B to the N. So what did it do? It credited the the uh, accounts receivable. Note that we have to have a customer in the accounts receivable, which I, I named ZZZ because I do not want to mess up the internal documentation within the ledger over here in the sales area for the customer uh, in Anderson was the actual person that this invoice was sold to. I don't want to have something in here with journal entries in his books because that's going to mess up the communication between our bookkeeper and Anderson possibly. They're going to be like, oh, that, no, the accountant did some funny journal entry. So we'll put it into a ZZZ uh, account. So hopefully that'll be out of the way, but still allow us to get our books correct. The sales uh, of product, we're going to reverse that. So that looks good. And then the sales tax, uh, we put in a sub account for sales tax payable of uh, the 25. So, it, so if there were multiple sales tax accounts, we can just apply it to one of them. We're reversing the cost of goods sold and the inventory has a sub ledger to it, which we saw last time was actually out off. And now it's going to be back on balance. It was off by $400 after the adjusting entries. QuickBooks not forcing us with the inventory to have an item to make the subledger force it to match as they do with the uh, subledger for accounts receivable by customer, which is actually makes it easier for us in the adjusting process. So let's go ahead and save and close it and check it out. Save and close it. 
and we'll go into the balance sheet so we can say okay what happened in march we did the reversing entry so let's go into march and for accounts receivable and check it out boom so now we have uh the actually we still labeled it adjusting entry i'd like to label it reversing entry let's go back into that one and see if i can fix that i'm going to say this is going to be reversing entry and i'll copy that memo all the way down okay let's save and close it again so now it's properly labeled as a reverse let's go back and refresh the report refresh and then i'll go back into it and it should then be properly labeled back in boom reversing entry so now we can see in march these two things cancel out so that that invoice is still in here because that's the original invoice but it's net it's netted out back to zero because we actually pulled it back into the prior period recognizing it in the prior period but we didn't want to delete this one instead we're netting it out in the current period in the current month with our uh reversing entry also you might say hey look why don't you put the reversing entry as of three five because because now it's going to show you why don't you do it as of the date of the actual invoice because then you'll have four or five more days where it's more correct otherwise this looks funny it's going to look funny until it matches out and the reason is that we want all of our reversing entries to happen at the same time. All of our adjusting entries happen at the end of the period. In our case, 229. All of the reversing entries happen at the beginning of the next period. In our case, 31. That making it easier for us to identify what is an adjusting and reversing entry. How do we know it is? It's because it's on 31. So it's on that date. And because it's a journal form, which isn't the normal form used, and because we put in the memo that it's a reversing entry. Now, if I go back and bring this to the second, so we see last month as well, we can see then here's us bringing it back with the adjusting entry into the prior period. And then the next month happens, and these two things are netting out against each other. So we brought it back into the prior period and neutralized it in the current period where the actual form was entered. Okay, let's go back and then go to the profit and loss. Check it out here. The other side goes to income. So in uh, March, we neutralized it. You can see right there. So now we had, that's when the actual invoice was input. And, uh, and then we put a negative amount. So it goes away. If I go back to the prior month, let's just go back one day then you can see we brought it back with the adjusting entry and then the original one is still there but we neutralized it we put in the, a base with the acid with the acid like taking pepto bismo or something and then it neutralized the acid in the i don't know if that analogy is a good one but same with the cost of goods sold here's the invoice and then we neutralized it if i go back cost of goods sold in the prior frame here's us bringing it back to the prior period here's the current period and the neutralization going back if we go to the balance sheet in the in the inventory same story the inventory has the same story people so we had the the 400 and the 400 neutralizing if i go back one day then there there is the adjusting entry decreasing it and then these two net out and then the same is the case with the sales tax that's the last account impacted a lot of activity so we made a separate account for the sales tax we put this one in there and then once again uh there's the reversing entry and if i go back we get the adjusting entry now this one you don't see the neutralization because we made a separate account for the sales tax that that we posted to instead of posting to the actual sales tax because there's not just one sales tax account there are multiple sales taxes that make up who we pay because there are multiple areas that we had to pay for state and local and so on 
So instead of trying to break out the sales tax to each of those individual accounts, we just grouped into one sales tax payable account as a subsidiary account to one of these sales tax accounts because that added detail probably isn't necessary for external reporting, in which case we're gonna group all the sales tax payable into one account because that's what external people will want to see, like the bank or something like that, or if you need it for taxes, you don't need to break it out typically by who you're paying, uh, who the vendor is. So that's the general idea there. Now, if we look at the subsidiary accounts for accounts receivable, let's open up the subsidiary account. I'm gonna go to the tab to the right, right click on it, duplicate it. And then we're gonna go into the reports on the left hand side, close up the ham boogie and scroll on down to who owes you. And let's look at the customer balance, uh, customer balance detail, let's do. And so if I if I look at this as of the cutoff date, let's make a custom date of 022924. That's the date we ran the financial statements. So so then if I scroll down, note that we added this customer ZZZ down here, instead of putting the sub ledger information in the customer where the invoice was actually tacked to, which was Anderson, so that we didn't have this journal entry form in Anderson's detail. But the total ties out to 270150. If I go to my balance sheet, let's get rid of this tab now. In February, it's 270150. And then if I go to the next date, if I if I go up a day, let's go to I'm sorry, let's go to 033124, the end of the following month, then now you can see the invoice is properly in Mr. Anderson's uh, place here, because that's the actual invoice, not the journal entry. And then we have the detail down below of the two ZZZs netting out against each other looking a little bit ugly, but at least it's at the bottom of the form. Notice that the total is still at the 270150 or is now at 270150, which is is tying out here. So we still are tied out uh, in March after we do the reversing entry and the invoice was entered. Let's look at that internally. If I go internally here and I go into my customers and we look at, for example, uh, Mr. Anderson. So notice I don't have any journal entries. So Mr. Anderson, if they communicate with the bookkeeper, the bookkeeper is not gonna be like, oh wait, there's like a, an adjusting journal entry. I don't know what that is. That, 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 right, that's gonna be a problem because we just did it for financial reporting purposes. And then if I go down to customer uh, ZZZZ, to do, which is down here, this is where to do, the message which is down is here, the journal entries are this located. Is where now note that I might be able to even clean this up a little bit, uh, even though they're journal entries, by making a payment form and linking these two together. So you'll note right now, and this is kind of ugly because these two are on my on, on my subsidiary report. I'd like to match them to each other, match them out so they're no longer showing as outstanding as though they show like kind of like an invoice and then a payment. So if I go over here, I could do that actually. I can hit the drop down and say, I'm gonna make a payment. I'm not actually gonna record a payment. I'm just gonna net those two out with the payment form. So I'm gonna say, there's the, uh, the journal and then here's the other side of it, right? So, so these, the two journal entries are gonna net out against each other, not recording anything because we're not actually receiving a payment. Nothing's gonna go into the payment to deposit. In other words, what does a payment to deposit form normally do? A payment form, it decreases accounts receivable and the other side usually goes into the, into the cash account. But in our case, nothing's gonna go into the cash account because we have two sides of the transaction that are impacting accounts receivable. We've got like a credit, it would be like having a customer credit that we're applying out to the invoice. And so they're gonna net out against each other. And we'll be able to see that because nothing will go into the, to the deposit. So let's save that. And so that's pretty neat. So now we've, we've closed these out uh, here. And then if I go into my balance sheet and I run it, we can see there shouldn't be anything in that payment to deposit account still. And then if I go into my sub ledger, then, and I run this again, these two should go away. So I'm going to say, let's, let's run this again and boom, the two ZZZs are gone. 
So that might be a method that you could use by still using the same client of Mr. Anderson. In other words, you might have put the same journal entries into Anderson, which is messy because you still have those journal entries in there. But at least you can net the journal entries against each other. And then you, if you wanted to present a sub ledger backing up or supporting your accounts, you would have you would have Anderson in there, although it would still look funny because it would look like a journal entry. But at least then when you're done and doing the reversing entry, you can net the two out against each other. So if I went back to the detail internally, for example, then within Mr. Anderson, you'd have this information that the bookkeeper would have to deal with, but at least they're showing as green, paid, paid, and closed. So they're, they're not gonna be these open uh, journal entries in there. So you can kind of decide what would be the best method, noting the methods that you could use. If I go back on over here and say, if you do an adjusting entry to accounts receivable, here's your options. Number one, don't touch accounts receivable at all. Make another account to do it, but you can't make it a subsidiary account of accounts receivable because then you'd have to make it an accounts receivable type of account, in which case you might still have to deal with the sub ledgers and therefore you'd have to make another account called accounts receivable as an other current asset, which is a little bit ugly because now then you'd have two separate accounts, but then you could do an adjusting entry without messing up the sub ledgers at all. Your second option, you use accounts receivable, add a customer, but add another customer such as ZZZ, putting it at the bottom of the list so that you have the activity in a customer that's, that's there exclusively for your adjusting entries and hopefully doesn't bother the bookkeeper much or you use the the same customer that is linked to the adjustment that you're doing in our case the mr anderson which would make your sub ledger actually correct as of the cutoff so you wouldn't have a different customer zzz customer if you needed the sub ledger and then you can basically link the two out so it's still kind of messy internally for the bookkeeper but at least it's kind of closed out you don't have those open items those, those are your options if we look at the similar but different method that QuickBooks uses for the inventory here, uh, remember that the inventory has a subledger too if we're using a perpetual inventory system, but QuickBooks did not force us to have a similar thing to the accounts receivable, an item. In other words, the subsidiary ledger for the accounts receivable has customers. The subsidiary ledger for inventory has items. For accounts receivable, they forced us to use a customer when doing a journal entry for inventory, they do not force us to do an item, which means our sub ledger is actually off when we do our journal entry, but we're okay with that because then we reverse it. So let's take a look at that. Let's go to the tab to the right, duplicate it. And then we're gonna go down to our A to the R again, uh, or our reports. I don't know, AR, what am I talking about? And then we'll put it, we'll go into inventory, inventory valuation summary. And let's see it as of as of 022924. That's our cutoff. Pulling out the trustee calculator. This is broken out by item and the cost per unit. And we we did a journal entry, but we didn't have to add an item. So you can see this one's at 4746 minus what's on the balance sheet as of February for inventory which is 4346. It's off by the 400, which is the journal entry we did uh, as of that time period. So our sub ledger, if we wanted to provide the sub ledger like externally with the reports, we would have to adjust it for the journal entry that we put uh, in place. However, you, you know, that might be an easier thing to do than if QuickBooks forced us to add an item which would mess up the sub ledger, which is there in flow assumptions that with a first in first out kind of whole thing, right? But if I go to the next period, back to 033124, then we're back in balance, hopefully, because that now we're at the 4346, which should match what's on the balance sheet here, 4346. So notice how much easier that is because now I don't have to worry about really messing up the bookkeeper or at all. I'm just gonna say, okay, I'm just gonna throw the sub ledger off, but I know exactly what I threw the sub ledger off by, and then I will reverse it and the sub ledger will be back in place. So that gives us, QuickBooks has given us more leeway 
to to do what we need to do there, which makes it easier if we know what we're doing. But it also makes it more likely that our sub ledger gets out of whack at some point, and then and then you got to figure out what to do, what to do when that happens, right? All right, so that's it. Let's uh, that's where we stand. Here's where our balance sheet is as of now. Here is our uh, income statement. Ba boom. And let's take a look at the trial balance. Here's the trusty trial balance. So our cutoff date is February. So that's when we did the adjusting entry. And then here's we did the reversing entries in March. So you can check out both of those columns to make sure that we're uh, in the same spot or we're in the same uh, on the same books. We're we're looking at the same page. We're re we're reading the same novel, and it's and it's excellent. Uh, so that's that.